Welcome to Author Nation. Um, today we are diving into no excuse book marketing, and we're going to explore key issues such as how much time should you spend, uh, you know, how much help do we need, and much, much more. I'm your host, Melody Ann, and I'm here to guide you toward actionable ideas that will help you not only write with purpose, but connect with your readers. And actionable ideas is incredibly important to me. It's lovely to listen to a podcast. It's even better when you take have takeaways that you can go and do, and that's what we're committed to do with you today, and also at authornation.com online, you'll find a treasure trove of resources to help you along the way as well. So whether you are sipping your morning coffee or winding down for the day, settle in as we explore how to uh, have no excuses and successful book marketing. Our guest, Larry Midas, is the chief excuse obliterator. I love that title. CEO. Uh, he is the founder of Speaking of Strategy. He is an independent business consultant, speaker, author, podcaster, and educator, educator with a wealth of practical hands-on experience. His expertise encompasses leader development, organizational design, employee engagement, and sales and marketing strategy, which is what we'll be talking about today. His clients run the gamut from mom and pop businesses to international enterprises. He is a frequent contributor on LinkedIn and numerous business blogs and has been featured in the Business Innovators Radio Network. He's also been uh, he's also a speaker for Vistage International, the world's largest executive coaching organization. And he is the author of We Tried That Once and other popular excuses that sabotage your business success. Let's welcome Larry. Hi, Larry. How are you today? Oh, Melanie, I'm fabulous. Thank you so much. How are you doing today? I'm I'm fabulous. So I love your book. We tried that once. <laughs> and other popular excuses that sabotage business success. And and in that book you talk about breaking free from excuses so that you can actually take action and become successful. So what are some of the common excuses you hear about why authors are not marketing their books effectively? Um, I think I hear things like, I don't have the time, I don't have the know-how or the knowledge, I didn't know so much of the marketing was, was going to land on me as, as an author, and I understand all that, and I, and I hear all that, and um, you live through that. But when I'm not only speaking about books, but actually when I work with my clients that I consult in business, I think we have to get ourselves away from the mindset of we assume more people know about us, about our businesses, about our books than really do. I mean, let's be honest. Your family knows about you and what you do in your book. Your friends, maybe a sprinkling of your neighbors. And in reality, that's about it. And when you look at how many humans are on the planet and do the math of how many people know absolutely nothing about you, nothing about your business, nothing about your book. It's a huge number. And so I kind of live in a world that says, I do live in the world that says every single day, part of our day is building that, that top of mind awareness about ourselves, our businesses, and in this case, our books. And I, I think one of the reasons maybe people don't do that is sometimes we feel like we're poking people too many times. We're nudging them too often. And I'm thinking, I go to bed every night and go, okay, how many people did I not reach today? Did I not connect with today? You know, what part of this, the state, the country, the world? Um, and it's easy. It's easy. Myself, guilty as charged, it's easy to fall into that excuse trap and say, you know, this is bigger than me. I didn't go to school for this. I thought my publisher was going to do this. But, but the reality is they're just convenient excuses. And if we develop a discipline we can be much better book marketers. Yeah, brilliant. So, I want to talk I want to talk about mental barriers because I think most of what we're talking about are mental barriers, but I just want to touch on very briefly like what's a real excuse and what excuses can we overcome? So, I'll give you an example. When when my youngest was uh, 2 2 and a half, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and needed care. 
And I became her full-time caregiver. I had two kids. One was a competitive athlete. <laughs> and, um, and then I had work. And I really had to cut down what I did. And even then, I was like, are you doing enough? Right, like it's, which, which in hindsight seems a little crazy, but there's this, there's this, you know, what is a real excuse and what isn't a real excuse? Can you just touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I think it really comes down to to discipline, and and again, sometimes I'm as lazy as they get, and sometimes I'm as disciplined as as they get. As an independent consultant, I work from my home, and my wife has always said to me, "I don't know how you do your job because I would be so distracted." And sure, there are days I get distracted or I get off the computer after six hours and go for a walk around the block or throw in a load of laundry. But I think it really comes down to human behaviors and behaviors that we are disciplined enough to execute often enough to become habits. Um, you know, and I really, I think we're, there, there are many, many, many intelligent people in the world listening to your podcast. Of course, they're intelligent. That's why they're listening. But we have to be able to say, this is, this is a priority of my activity. So I'll use myself as an example. My, my work week, basically my work days, I structure this way. If I'm not physically working with a client, A, I jump to B, which is I'm looking for a new client. If I'm not doing B, I jump to C, which is I'm speaking somewhere, speaking engagement. If I'm not speaking somewhere, I jump to D, which is I'm looking for my next speaking engagement. I'm bidding jobs, answering RFPs. If I'm not doing any of that, I'm marketing my book. Yeah. And if I'm not yeah. doing that, I go back to A. So in the example you just gave, you know, um, business owner, operator, spouse, mom, caretaker jumped in there for a while. So we need to adjust maybe the amount of time we're spending in those disciplines, but we don't let one disappear. We just give it maybe a little bit less time. And, and, and that's, that's tough to ask people to do. Um, but when I look at some of the most successful people I know in life, in business, no matter what industry they're in, the people that seem to be the most successful really have that discipline. And it's not that they're robotic. It's not that they don't have fun. It's not that they don't take days off, but they know priority A, B, C, D, and maybe E, and they just keep working there and then they shift their time accordingly. Um, I, I hear people when they say, I didn't go to school to be a marketer, but those are all things you can learn from people like you. You can learn from courses. You can learn online. I love to learn by trial and error. So, you know, my, my advice to, to, you know, the viewers and, and listeners is don't be afraid to try. Yes. Yes. And I love that. Think, think like the person you want to get your book into their hands. Who are they? Where are they? What's the best way or, or modality to communicate with them? What's the best time of day, week, month, or year? You know, there are some industries, you know, if you're trying, if I, my, my book is a business book, basically, I'm not going to try to get accountants to read my book between January 1st and April 15th. Forget it. Forget it. They're yeah. working 90 hours a week in their own little world. So I could, I could, I could drop free books out of a helicopter and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I want to get into specifics, but I just want to add something to that because I remember reading, uh, I think it was in Forbes, an article. They, they've done a, a study, uh, super scientific, but they interviewed CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and they asked them, how did you get to where you are right now? And they figured out with all these, you know, they tabulated everything and they figured out that when they, as they were rising up through the ranks, 10% of their time was spent on learning. I think we spent a lot, way too much time on learning. 20% was spent working with others like coaches, mentors, things like that. 70% of their time that contributed to their success was spent on doing. And I think that's a really good, you know, really good thing to think about because a lot of people are like, oh, I need a coach and I and I need to take another course and I need to learn and I need. And it's like, oh, no, you can learn a lot just by, as you said, doing trial and error. 
Right. And, 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 you know, you don't need globs of feedback. You can do a lot of mini polls, you know, ask three or four people, ask a total stranger. And, and, you know, folks groups used to be big. There were elaborate studios and two way mirrors and hidden microphones. And those are all wonderful things. And, and I love those people. And, and I love that approach, but it doesn't have to be so structured. Yes. Um, you know, when I was searching for the title of my book, I just literally went out and said to people, if I wrote a book and called, we tried it that once. And as soon as I said that, they started laughing and I knew I was on to something because every single person looked at me and said, welcome to my world. Welcome to my life. Welcome to my business. So I'm like, OK, good. <laughs> yes. I didn't have to spend a million dollars researching that. Let's go. Yes, yes, yes. They're like, you're talking about me right there. Mm -hmm. So Beautiful. OK, let's get into the, the details. So one of the most frequent questions is how much time should I spend marketing my book? Based on your experience as an author, what is uh, how can authors strike a balance uh, there? Well, and again, I alluded to it earlier. I, I don't want to say 37 minutes a week, but I will say identify your top four or five priorities. And, and to me, for most people in business, that's how I make money, what brings in revenue. Yeah. And then think through, and during the year, those priorities might change. Cyclical businesses, things like that. We just talked about accountants and tax season. But the honest truth is we should be promoting our books every single day, everywhere we go. And we can do it very, very subtly. We don't have to have fireworks and, and, and banners and, and parades. I can't tell you, well, I could tell you of, of some of the things I've done to market my book to plant the seed with someone. And if I do that once a day, I, I check that box and go, hey, I, I marketed today. It's the discipline of not falling into the trap of saying, oh my gosh, three months have gone by and I've done absolutely nothing to promote my book. Um, so so it's, it's the discipline, it's the A, B, C, D, E steps. It's thinking outside the box. Um, yeah. I look at books all the time out in the world and usually the first question I ask myself is, how did that book get there? And the answer might not be obvious. I was just traveling on some speaking engagements recently, and I had a layover in Las Vegas. And I walked into the concession store, and they had a very limited, but they had books. And I said to the clerk, how did these books get here? She was fabulous. She took out a piece of paper. She got out her pen. She wrote down the corporate phone number. Go to this website. Bing, 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 bing. Here's the process. Yeah. Or I could have walked in, bought a jelly donut and a cup of coffee and turned around and walked out yeah. and, and not thought about how did those books get there? Yeah. I love that. Um, and, and I think the next thing is with authors there are so many ways to market your book and you just said right like you know i just walked into a store there's so many ways there's kind of a, a you know paralysis by analysis so how can an author identify what is worth pursuing and uh what is uh what's a distraction and again i think you have to think about you, the the book the content and the audience uh because again i i could probably take a booth at a fall art and craft festival and have my big pull-up banner for my book and hope something would happen. But that's, even though those people make excuses every day, that's really not my primary audience. I'll be honest with you. I, I've been in and around higher education, university level for 28 years. It took me three months to figure out, I knocked on the doors of 60 colleges and universities in the United States and they all said, hey, drop dead. I can't blame them because guess what? My book is not a textbook. It's not written like a textbook. So if, if I'm marketing down the lane of required reading, it's never going to fit. But if I'm marketing to universities down the lane of recommended reading, it might fit. So it's just the strategy of, of where's my audience? What resonates with them? How do I get to them even maybe through a, a, a backdoor channel? Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. And and as you said earlier, I, I'm not sure you said it exactly like this, is but if 
uh, you know, if you spend five to 10 minutes a day speaking to one person, that's 365 people a year. And you can choose to speak to one person who might buy your book, or you can choose to speak to the, the store owner who might carry your book, or you could choose to speak to a, a, you know, a podcaster who will have you on the show who has thousands of, of listeners who might be interested in your book, right? So, but that's still five minutes a day. Right. And, and, that, and, and I mean, Saturday and Sunday and, and, I guess I'm a little bit different. My, my publisher represents about 75 authors and he's always told me for four years, Larry, you're the only guerrilla marketer I have. Yeah. I'm always calling going, how many did we sell? Where should I go next? What book convention are you going to? I'll go with you because a lot of people write, I think, and, 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 and cross their fingers. And yeah. the good news is, you know, when I wrote my book, Melody, I was intrigued. I, I thought, well, how many people in the world are actually published authors? Not writers, published authors. And that answer is 5%. 5% of the world's population. That's now, higher people, than it used to be. Yeah. A lot of people write, a lot of people yeah. journal, but most people don't publish. And I always look at my peers in, in, in the authorship industry and say, you, you did the easy part. The marketing I'll go to my grave on this one is the difficult part. Now I happen to love it. I've always been involved in media, radio, TV, outdoor newsprint. So it's kind of in my DNA, but it's, again, it's the backdoor approach. When I first uh, wrote my book, I sent one to Tony Robbins. I didn't send it to his corporate office. I sent it to his house. Yeah. My wife said, how did you find out where he lives? I said, he pays property taxes. It's in the property tax rate. Yes. People watch. Uh, people probably watch in, in your audience Netflix and and watch Ryan Serhant. Yeah. I like Ryan. I like his gusto. I like his energy. I sent him a book. I emailed him. I call him, and I'm the kind of guy in a very polite, professional way. You can look me right in the eye and say, "No, thank you, Larry. I don't want your products yeah. or services." I'm fine with that. You can yeah. look me in the eye and say, "Yes, let's dance together." But the yeah. people who ignore me. I am not going to let them go yeah. until I get an answer. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very professional and polite about it, but it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't take long to say yes, no, or maybe. Uh, yes. So I, I guess, you know, the moral of that story is look in the unconventional places. I, I, I'm dealing with uh, attempting to deal with a major airline here in the United States. I, I hunted down the CEO and said, instead of a torn and tattered 10 month old magazine on your planes, why not my book? Yes, no, or maybe. You know, look for yeah. the avenues that aren't obvious. A lot of people have book signings in bookstores. I've got one coming up in a bookstore, but most of my book signings have not been in bookstores. They've been in furniture stores, coffee shops. Because you say to yourself, well, who goes to bookstores? People who read books. But are they going to read my kind of book? And my goal for a non-bookstore book signing is I'll say to that retailer, my job is to get people to come into your store who maybe would never come in here. But while they're here, I'm going to walk them around and we're going to tour together. If they buy my book, great. If they don't, that's okay too. But I'm really helping you build traffic. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, boy, if 30 people come in we've never met before, that's great. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think you've answered this, but I, I'm, I'm just, I want to ask it, um, really directly so that so that everyone's clear a lot of authors think i can't do it alone i need help i need to pay someone tons of money yeah you know, it's to get to I, you know, I was looking up the other day a best-selling campaign can cost up to four thousand dollars and you may only sell a hundred books so there's this idea it's like well i need to pay someone and i need to do this and i need to do that uh, do you believe that authors need somebody else to market their book for them? Or do you think they should really just take matters into their own hands? Uh, with all due respect to some of the people that might be viewing and, and listening, uh, I don't think you need outside help. Yeah, It's my DNA as a business consultant. You know, I, I coach my clients to vet everything, probe everything, question everything. And I do that with myself and my own business. Yeah. So, yes, I've had people reach out to me. Many of them through LinkedIn, you know, I can get you on the New York Times bestseller list. I can this, I can that. So then we talk and it's like, oh, it's going to be, you know, $2,000 a month, minimum three month commitment. I'm like, I can buy a lot of, I can send a lot of media mail 
to people for six thousand dollars. And, and and again, I think it's it's the discipline. I think those folks, no offense to them, can sell their services because they have a network, they have a call list, they have a process. Once an author builds their own process, you just plug yourself in. I'll be very honest with you. I've had the good fortune, the good fate in, in the last month of, of appearing on a number of different podcasts. Yours, head and shoulders above the rest. Yeah. But yeah. it didn't cost me anything but my time. Yes. And I got yeah. onto some of the podcasts that people wanted to charge me for that would have been a severe amount of money. Yeah. And, and quite honestly, and, and I can say this because I lived the life, I, I lived in the media world. I was in radio. I was nearly in television. And most hosts, writers, it's a dream come true when somebody knocks on their door and says, would you be interested in talking to me about this? I'm a subject yes. matter expert. It is a dream come true versus them looking for that. And and I've, I've got to tell you, looking on my own, approaching and asking on my own, my conversion ratio is about 65%. Oh, that's good. Yes. So two-thirds and, of the people are saying yes. Yeah, yeah. And and the idea is that, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say what, as a host, what I'm looking for is somebody who fits my podcast and so you can actually increase your conversion rate by pitching the right podcasts right rather than pitching the wrong podcasts and and i think that's you know it's it's pitching the right podcast and giving that podcast host enough information that they go i see how this fits this is fabulous because that's what i'm looking for yeah and, and quite honestly no one knows your book as well as you do yeah. So if you have an agent or a publisher or someone who claims they can get you on podcasts and they're pitching you, they're never going to pitch you with the excitement and the knowledge and the stories that you have as the author. And that's where the sale takes place. Exactly. So uh, as we wrap up, I want to I want to go back to your book because your book is all about taking action. And that's that's what it's about. No more excuses. Take action. So what are three action steps that authors can take right now who are making excuses for themselves but no longer want to do that, what would you recommend? On a plain piece of paper, nothing fancy, draw a seven-day chart, you know, Sunday through Saturday. Record every day, handwrite what you're doing to promote your book that day. At the bottom of the chart, Put down a minimum. I'm going to make three contacts a week, three emails, three media mails of, of my book, two book signings or whatever it is. And then at the end of every week, end of every month, go back and look at your activity and then look for places where you can ramp it up. So it's it's that discipline. Um, I think exercises um, uh, like today, I, I think there are, there are tens of thousands of podcasts out there in the world. I've been interviewed by people in the farthest corners of the, the planet. Reach out. Meet them, speak to them, find out how you can help each other, try to be a guest on, uh, on the show. And, and, and I really think, think unconventionally. Again, like I said earlier, how did this book get on the shelf? Who are the people I, I, I can reach out to? I was watching a college basketball game one day on a Saturday afternoon, and they interviewed one of the coaches inside his library, inside his home, his personal library. And he was surrounded by books. And, and the interviewer said to him, are these books about coaching? He said, oh, I don't read any of that. He said, these are business and leadership books. Yeah. My radar went, Bum. send yeah. that guy a book. Yeah. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. We've never met. We probably will never meet. But yeah. it, it's that, you know, how do you get someone's attention? Because your approach is, is a little bit different. And, and again, it doesn't have to be 50 hours a week, but it's got to be that rhythm of consistent outreach. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. If you're looking for Larry, and I think you should, you can learn more about Larry at speakingofstrategy.org. Larry, thank you for joining us today. I really My pleasure, Melody. You. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us today on Author Nation interviews. I hope this conversation has helped you obliterate your excuses so you can take your nonfiction writing journey uh, to the level you want it at. So, and also remember to visit 
authornation.online for your treasure trove of resources. And I always appreciate your feedback and your support. So if you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a comment or a review and sharing it with someone you know will benefit from it. Your participation helps us continue delivering insights and the tools you need to succeed. So keep writing, keep creating, and continue to share your unique stories with the world. 